Thanks everyone for joining us right after lunch. And in case you are wondering, what is Jay doing up there? Why do we have a picture of him uh, conducting a session? Well, that's because DevOps is very much like conduction. You're trying to just get a lot of moving pieces to work together. And with that said, a little bit more about myself. Uh, as Nigel already mentioned, uh, I'm a faculty member at UT Austin and the CEO and co-founder of a consulting firm named Flux7. Uh, the uh, Flux7 uh, generally focuses on cloud and container consulting. And that's really uh, what we've been known for, uh, having existed over, for about three years now. So what is the relationship between Flux7 and Fugo Chance? The primary project is at Fugo Chance, and uh, we were actually brought in uh, by Fugo Chance to help them with primarily three things. One, architecting that solution using containers and cloud. Two, uh, help with some implementation and compress the timelines of the project. We had some very heavy uh, newsworthy projects, if you will, uh, that were riding on the back of the technology that you're going to be seeing. And we had some very tight deadlines to meet. And then lastly, and very importantly, if you're a large enterprise that is about to embark on a DevOps journey with cloud and containers, upskilling of your staff and your engineers is extremely important. So that was the last part of the job, which is make sure that uh, we can instill the knowledge and not just implement the solution. So first part, uh, I'm going to leave the details to uh, Jay, uh, and he's going to be going into a lot more depth. But at a high level, with the goals of in productivity, DevOps, uh, at the same time getting things done really fast, the selection of technologies that we chose was Docker, uh, AWS as the compute platform, and very heavy use of automation across the board, all the way down from networking layers, all the way up to the actual uh, deployment of the application and the containers. So combination of Docker, AWS, and CloudFormation. Uh, I mentioned earlier that when we started working with uh, Fugo Chance, there was a very heavy weight project riding on our back in terms of getting things out quickly. And at the same time, uh, this is just Flex7 having been a part of nearly 150 of uh, these projects, it's very important that if you're an organization, a large enterprise trying to adopt a technology like this, that we don't try to go zero to 60 in 2.5 minutes. The goal is to uh, roll out the changes one step at a time, providing business value at each step, and uh, roll them out in a manner that uh, it, they can be consumed and hit the immediate deadlines. So with that, uh, I still think in binary, so phase zero, was the first phase, as we named it, uh, which was basically just one step along the way uh, in the journey to DevOps, which was basically just bring in infrastructure as code, uh, use EC2 instances um, on AWS as they were provided, and run Docker uh, on top of those instances. At the, in the beginning, get the application up, go to production very quickly, and simplicity was the goal. Uh, then we went into phase one, taking it to the next level, Increasing the level of automation, the use of containers uh, became significantly heavier, and following uh, more of the best practices. And one of the things that we have been uh, communicating a lot lately has been what is phase two going to look like, something, uh, how do you actually go and take uh, this to the next level? And Jay will talk more about the final outcome. So as I mentioned earlier uh, at Flux7, uh, one of our key things is to not become a part of the mission-critical day-to-day operations, but more importantly, help transform the enterprise. Uh, and that requires upskilling of the engineers at the company. Uh, one of the solutions that we deployed here is what we call Flux7 Engage, where the idea is to team up some experienced Flux7 architects with engineers uh, at the customer, uh, such that there's Implementation getting done, but at the same time, a deep knowledge transfer is happening uh, for the customers, so, which is done through daily office hours, debugging sessions, uh, knowledge transfer sessions, etc. So with that, I'll actually let you see what Fugo owes, what we were able to accomplish with this technology. Fugro's office-assisted remote services, known as OARS, uses internet and cloud-based technologies to connect survey vessels to onshore Fugro command centers, enabling experts to gain direct access to offshore survey projects. Located around the world, the command centers are manned by Fugro surveyors 
who are able to conduct tasks as though they were physically on board the vessels. This provides oars-based surveys with access to a broader base of global expertise and 24-7 monitoring and support. The system also enables onshore clients to gain real-time access to vessel operations and data through a secure web interface. With oars, planning is easier and projects can be conducted more quickly because constant access to experts means that operations can be conducted at the optimal time and decision-making and interpretation of quality control data is more streamlined. And since surveyors are onshore, crew levels can be optimised, helping to reduce costs, HSE exposure and logistics. Oars, remote access for survey projects around the world. So with that, uh, one of the engineers that went through the Flex7 Engage program was uh, Jay here. And I'll let Jay get into the more technical depth of what, uh, how we actually implemented the solution in the back end. Thank you, August. Otter. Good afternoon. Um, now that we have the commercial done with, <laughs> I'll pick on Otter a little bit. Um, we had some very specific challenges. First of all, we're a global company who uh, we're just now dragging ourselves, kicking and screaming into the cloud, into Docker, uh, <clears throat> into several other technologies. We've been traditionally one of those engineering companies where software developers work in their own offices and very rarely interact with each other. Right away, we identified three major challenges with ORs. Uh, first of all, how do we support a unique real-time application that has to communicate with UDP messaging and WebSockets in real time? Um, and how do we do it globally? Number two, how do we version a web application? Web applications are notoriously unversionable. Engineers or developers or scripters make changes to JavaScript or CSS or PHP or HTML or whatever. And they all push that up to the server or servers and hope that it works, but there's no real, uh, no real um, sense for when those changes were made to the application as a whole. All of our other compiled software is very heavily versioned. It's, it's in Git repos, and we, we send that out. Uh, when we do send out updates and new versions, uh, it's a very easy thing to do because you're sending out an executable file, and since you're sending out a single file, you can send out a single version. And then furthermore, how do we support future development, especially when additional microservices b might be needed? So I need your help. We're going to do a little audience participation here. What is the solution to all three of these problems? Hey, thank you. We got one guy. Now can everybody else on three? One, two, three. Wow, such enthusiasm. Y'all ate way too much lunch. <laughs> so, oh, they didn't drink the coffee? I drank the coffee. Not so good. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the ORS infrastructure and the Internet of Things device that we are using uh, that we've put together and that we manufacture in-house. Um, you can see in the cloud down here, there's a, a rack-looking box. And this is our Internet of Things device. It's got two Windows embedded server, or, uh, computers in it. It's got a Raspberry Pi. It's got GPS. It's got Wi-Fi. It's got a switch. It's got all sorts of things that interact with each other. And all of this uh, uh, equipment, when it's hooked up, starts sending out UDP messaging. And so the UDP message travels over satellite connection and to our gateway, and our gateway is, is where we're uh, dockerizing everything now. We're also going to dockerize the application inside the Internet of Things device. Once it's hit the gateway, then it can be consumed by either end-user customers like Exxon or Shell or Mobile who want to be able to observe a ship's operations where they have a concern. Maybe they're putting divers in the water. Maybe they're repairing uh, an oil platform. Maybe they're laying pipe. Uh, and 
the company man sitting back in the office in, in Annapolis, Maryland, or Houston, Texas, wants to be able to observe what's going on. So they can connect to the gateway, and once they do, and they request the information from a particular vessel, a WebSocket connection is made to that vessel, uh, we subscribe to the information that the user is looking for, and the vessel publishes the information out of the Internet of Things device. Uh, it's not terribly complex, except we have some limitations. We're only allowed 128K on the satellite, so we have to be really efficient with our messaging. We use a lot of JSON. Uh, we need to send the relevant information. When looking at the screen, they need to be able to see the map of the seafloor along with all the pipeline or wellheads or manifolds and other subsea assets. Uh, they need to see the vessels in relation to that. They also need to see anchors in relation to that because it would be bad to drop an anchor on a pipeline as one big company learned not too recently, uh, not too long ago. Um, so this is basically the overview for the ORS uh, device. Now, why do we put the device on the vessel? Traditionally, vessels operate with surveyors on board. The surveyor runs a very complex piece of software and he sits next to the captain. There has to be three surveyors on board because they operate 24 seven. There are divers in the water in the dark. Uh, they, that's the nature of the operations. The reason that they operate 24 seven is because they have to maximize their use of time and money to, to uh, perform the operations that they're performing. Um, and so I'm just giving you this, a lot of this as background, but what we did is we, by putting an Internet of Things device on board, we can take the surveyors off board, so that's disruptive. We can put the surveyor in a command center, and now the surveyor, instead of being focused on one vessel, can focus on as many as five or six at a time, because surveyor operations on board these vessels is typically nine to ten hours of boredom, separated by 15 minutes of intense panic every once in a while. So that's the background. So let's get to how microservices play in this. We did find that we had several microservices and some not so microservices that we needed to establish. The software on board, the IoT device is very complex. Uh, the web application that delivers the information to the end user is very complex. The messaging service and the database are all very complex items, but really can be separated into microservices. And, and so once we started laying the cards out on the table, we figured out uh, that we could do a really good job of separating them. And you should separate services or microservices, one per container, but I'm gonna tell a tale that some of you may have, uh, may have encountered. We had one application and one microservice that shared a number of the same resources, database connections and information from the database, um, uh, processing resources, and so we made the decision, or we tried to make, we wanted to make the decision, we needed to put two microservices in one container. The Docker folks will tell you that's bad, but if you do it well and if you do it correctly, you can do it quite easily. We chose to go with Supervisor D. Uh, there was a session yesterday on Supervisor D that was awesome. It went into a lot of depth. And if you're looking for blazing technical insight on how to use Supervisor D, this is not the place to be because we employ it very simply. And I'm going to show you that in just a moment. Supervisor D allowed us to put these two microservices in one container so that they could continue to share the resources that they needed to share without us having to re-architect one microservice or the other, or maybe duplicates, duplicate things like database information. So now we have three microservices to operate ORS with. Here's our Docker file. This is how we spin up the, the paired microservices, and what we do is we've got Apache that we run as our web server, which is pretty standard. Uh, we've added some things for logging. We've added the loading in of the supervisor configuration file. And then we just start, we expose the ports that we need to expose, and we start Supervisor D. Um, and 
part of what I want to tell you here is you don't have to make your Docker implementation complex. There are a lot of complex Docker implementations running around this building right now. And I've looked at some of them and just been stymied <laughs> at the complexity of what's going on. But that's okay. If, it, <clears throat> if your Docker implementation is required to be complex, it's good that you can do that, but it's not necessary. This is running in production every day, all day, and has been running in production for the past several months. When we start Supervisor D, we don't flex a lot of the power available to us in Supervisor D yet because we're just learning. But simply for us, the configuration file starts the Apache service and then starts a PHP broadcast processor. The PHP broadcast processor listens for JSON messages coming via UDP, processes those messages, forwards them along to a messaging server, which then uh, receives them and establishes the WebSocket connection back to the vessel so that we can start subscribing to the data coming back from the vessel. It's fairly simple. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be complex. I could have put some things in Supervisor D like auto restart on fail, uh, uh, specific logging for specific events coming out of the supervisor uh, system or for coming out of the, uh, uh, the broadcast processor system. But right now, we just wanted, to, wanted it to simply work. We just want our containers to be simple. We want to know exactly what's in the container. We want to be able to version the container. We want to be able to start it, run it, and let it run forever. Um, the vessel captains and the vessel owners appreciate that a lot. <clears throat> so no blazing insight there. Um, technically, it's fairly simple. You've got a small Docker file, less than 20 lines. You've got a supervisor file, a configuration file that has more comments in it than it does actual code. Um, and it runs quite well. So how do we deliver this to our end users? How do we put this in play? On the surface, this is what our network looks like. Our vessels are communicating via satellite, their UDP packets, and connecting their web sockets. Then that information is being sent to a Docker container inside our EC2 instance, which processes that information just as we talked about. That container has a discussion with the other container in the EC2 instance to modify the information and, and, and um, make it available on the website uh, in real time so that a supervisor, when a captain picks up the phone, uh, the captain is rung into the commander center and he's talking straight away to that supervisor and they can enjoy their 15 minutes of panic together. Um, so our containers talk to each other, but they talk to each other fairly simply too. They send UDP packets back and forth. I could tell you a UDP joke at this point, but you might not get it. <laughs> I'll, I'll spare you the TCP joke. <clears throat> because we've timed out. Um, <laughs> the command centers are directly connected. It's all, you know, we've got our EC2 instances on our network. Uh, we've, um, we've specified a fairly large CIDR block to handle all of our OR systems. So uh, we can put our command centers on the same network. We can put the vessels on the same network. We can streamline communications and operations that way. And then we can let our external customers have access to a website. Uh, we provide, you know, we provide authentication to them so that they have to log into the website to see their information. They can't see competitors' vessels. Um, they can't see, uh, you know, uh, it's basic website design where you want to keep one person from seeing somebody else's stuff. So that's the basic out, uh, outline there for how we deliver this to the end customer. So now, what we have to do is we have to get these containers out to our production instances. And we want to go through the same level of testing that we all want to go through. We want to go through development testing, we want to stage it, we want to have other people look at it, and then we want to push it out to production. So the way we achieve this is fairly traditional. Our developers are working in a Git repo. You know, they push and pull code all day long. And then when they get ready to build their Docker containers, which they do several times a day, 
They run a build process that builds both the web application server and the messaging server. They can tag those with a version uh, information. And you can see here in pickle juice, we're tagging with uh, version numbers for the application and build numbers for the application. You can see that image IDs are the same. And I'm going to tell you all about the secret sauce right here for having two tags on the same image in just a second. Um, once they've built those and test it locally on a build server on-prem, then they push it out to Docker Hub where we have private repos for our, this particular uh, application. They push those out to Docker Hub and those are ready to be consumed uh, by the rest of the system. The reason we use two tags is for deployment purposes. Once I push it out to Docker Hub, I might not want to do anything with it right away. So if I just put a version number, that's good. Uh, somebody might say, oh, we need to make some changes, and we might not deploy that version. Uh, we found some problems here once we got it to the, the build server, the dev server. We don't, want to, uh, we don't want to push that out, or we want to pull it back, and we want to add some features or whatever we want to do. But once they tag it with the secondary tag, dev, staging or production, then our CI process, uh, our CD pro CI CD process kicks in. Jenkins, how many of you are familiar with Jenkins? Jenkins is our butler. Jenkins every once in a while makes a little trip over to Docker Hub and says, hey, do we have any new images? And if they have a new image named dev, Jenkins then tells code deploy in the dev AWS instance, hey, there's a new Docker image for you. You need to go retrieve that and deploy it on the dev VPC. And it becomes available within just a few minutes of being pushed to Docker Hub. If all is well, all we have to do is retag that same image staging and send it up to Docker Hub, and Jenkins goes and checks and says, oh, staging, guess what? You've got a new image available. Let's get that out and deploy. And the process goes on and on. Now, I've removed several layers of complexity here because we also have a business interest on when this stuff gets deployed and who gets to approve it and all the emails I send out every day saying, hey, you need to go test this feature and see if that's what you asked for. And so uh, there is a lot more business intervention in this process than I'm illustrating. But for simplicity's sake, and if you're, if you're the business person who's looking to simplify your CICD, you want to strip away the complexities because the complexities of dealing with people and having them approve versions and approve features is going to be your bottleneck every single time. Your code's been written. Your developers have tested it. You're, hopefully, you have a test group, which we are fortunate to do. It's one guy. I, he's not even big enough to be called a group. But we do have somebody who tests against the development uh, image on AWS, and once he approves it, it goes to staging, and that's where the bottleneck occurs. But the process is fairly simple, and it gets uh, new features out to the customer every single day, sometimes multiple times a day. We're not hampered technologically by being able to move the data around because once I've got a Docker, a working Docker container, I can take it and put it anywhere I want to. And you know, even with some of the new announcements that we've heard this week about running uh, Docker in Windows on your local machine, now I can, I can arm our developers with that so that they can consume Docker images and Docker containers and test them locally with not, not even needing to have a build server. We're always going to want them to have a build server. We're always going to want them to follow the versioning guide and you know, not work in a vacuum and do those things. But more and more, we're getting the tools from Docker that we need to get to put those things in place. How does it make future development easier? We can add microservices anytime we want to without disturbing the other microservices in the universe. Um, I'll give you an example. We talked about the divers a while ago. We're fixing to, fixing to, that's a good southern term. We're getting ready to uh, deploy 
divers with cameras on their helmets and, and voice where they can be underwater observing something and we're going to stream that video back to the end user sitting in their office. Because a lot of times divers will get down on the seafloor working around a rig or a wellhead and they'll see something that they need a second opinion on before they whip out their welder and possibly cause damage or uh, call for something to be moved or call for something to be changed. Rather than dismantling oars and putting, trying to shoehorn that in, we'll just put VStream in its own microservice. We'll deploy it just like we do everything else, dev staging and production. The developers will be able to build the Docker containers and, and or build the Docker images and ship the containers around just like we do with anything else. And it isolates that microservice from being able to disrupt any other microservices we have running in our VPCs. And it allows us to rapidly test that new microservice in a VPC. So what are the takeaways? Really, I've only been talking for 14 minutes. Oh, I've got 15 left. OK. Um, Oh, I, it's not a countdown clock, it's a count up clock. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so what are the takeaways here? Uh, first of all, supporting a unique application where we have uh, lots of communication going on with UDP and TCP web sockets is easy to accomplish with Docker. Uh, it's, uh, it's just a matter of exposing the right ports and, and then implementing your TCP web socket uh, communication and your UDP broadcast messaging. That's simple. We can easily version a web application now by putting it in a Docker container and versioning the container itself without having to worry about versioning whatever the files are inside the Docker container, uh, which could be a, a nightmare. We can easily deploy web applications, versioned web applications, because all we have to do is ship a container around. You can even put a container on a stick and take it over to you know, some other service and run it up if you need to, as long as you have uh, the Docker daemon running on that server. Um, and it's dramatically easy to, dis to deploy worldwide. If I have four production VPCs spread across, spread, spread across the globe, then Jenkins handles that for me by saying, oh, I've got, a, I've got a new production container ready. Let me tell each of the production VPCs that that container is ready, and then they go out and get that new container, bring it back, spin it up, and the user never even knows it happened. They can get a new service or a new feature in the middle of a session where they're watching a vessel or participating in vessel operations. And then finally, the last takeaway is that we can easily add uh, new features by, and uh, new services by spinning them up as their own microservices and only exposing what we need to expose either to the other containers or to the end user uh, without disrupting the development or the usage of the rest of the application. Um, Thank you for your time this afternoon. You've been a lot of fun. At least, you know, drank most of the coffee and said Docker really loudly. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to hear them. Just on the topic of questions, okay, we do have a microphone in the aisle right there. We're recording, so for video, um, if you've got a question, go line up behind the microphone and shout. Okay, so if we don't have questions, um, I do. Okay. Okay. I'm quite curious um, what your take is on, so you talked about using Supervisor D mm -hmm. and running multiple services within a single container. Um, wh where do you, or how do you strike the balance between making the effort to refactor an application to, to run it in the one service per container versus, you know, I'm asking, do you have right. a, any guidance drawing the line? We, we actually spent a fair amount of time discussing it. Um, I think the deciding factor for us was that each of the services, the web uh, application and the broadcast processor used um, a number of things that were already developed uh, and we didn't want to 
duplicate them in, in separate microservice containers because uh, it would become a management nightmare for one. Um, can the services be separated at some point? Absolutely. We're probably going to re you? Yeah, we're, we'll probably rewrite the broadcast processor at some point because when we started the project, it sounded like a good idea to write it in PHP and make it a web service. Probably not a good idea. Uh, ultimately, it'll probably become a much stronger, more ro robust uh, uh, processor on its own, and it'll, requ it'll uh, require less interaction with the current database and the current information uh, in the current uh, Apache and PHP kernel that we're running now. So when you come to refactor into um, you know, one, one service per container, um, will that be... Um, just the, the natural evolution of things, or will it be because you're not ultimately happy with the service D and with the way it is at the moment? You know, well, is no, there anything pushing you in that there's direction? There's nothing, nothing pushing us to do that other than a desire to uh, make sure we've cleaned up our own house, uh, that we're doing things in a smart way. Um, like I said, in this case, we've written the broadcast processor in PHP. It was written early on in PHP because it was easy to cobble together in an afternoon in PHP. And... While it works well at the level that we're operating now in production, when we start getting to 50 and 60 and 100 vessels, that broadcast processor is probably not going to be as efficient as it should be. And it, and it won't be because it's a Docker issue or, a, uh, or any of those kind of things, it'll, or an AWS issue, it'll be because that service needs to be more efficient. And if we can write it separately more efficiently, then that's what we'll do. Okay. Um, we're talking a lot about enterprise and security today from the keynotes. Mm -hmm. um, as, can I call you a grown-up company, a company that turns a profit and things like that, okay? Yes. Um, what's your experience been with regards to support? Um, and I'm thinking both support in standing the environment up in the first place, but then the kind of support that if this stuff goes down, um, what's your support experience been like there? Do you rely on Docker? Do you rely on the ecosystem? Do you rely on yourselves? Is it forums? What, what does that look like? Well, we, um, first of all, we, we do the Mayo Clinic method. We learn, do, teach. And so right now we're relying on ourselves for support on a lot of items because if a Docker container goes down, I can, I can figure it out. And I've taught others how to figure it out. And we've, and we've recently had an issue where the messaging server was causing the Docker container to exit, but it wasn't Docker's fault, it was the Haskell's fault. I, I saw a couple of people cringe when I said Haskell. The messaging service is written, written right now in Haskell, and it's being refactored, but Haskell will exit for no apparent good reason from time to time. And when it does, it causes the Docker container to fail, and when you list out your Docker containers when that happens, you know, get a call from a command center going, none of the vessels are communicating. And the first thing I do is I check the health of the containers, and if any one of them has stopped, the Haskell server, then I just start it again, and we, we identified a problem with that. Uh, we actually put it on a bigger AWS instance, gave it more memory, more core, and that stopped that problem. Again, it wasn't a Docker issue. It was just a, uh, a service that we were running in Docker that was the issue. So we're relying on ourselves for support. I, early on when we were developing the product, I spent many hours, one long seven hour day on the phone with AWS uh, where they didn't understand how web sockets worked and they weren't sure why were we putting them in containers and, and we, we went through a lot of song and dance to get that fixed. Um, and, and now AWS is, is getting better with their uh, container services. Matter of fact, they're, they've got their ECS now, and uh, so we'll, we'll be looking at utilizing that and, and uh, flexing the power of ECS for auto restarting containers so that I don't have to get a phone call in the middle of the night to restart a container or to check to make sure that the containers are running and, and healthy. It's always uh, in our DevOps operation, which we consider our DevOps operation to be like a toddler. We're just now learning to walk in DevOps. And uh, in that, we're also learning how to support what we're doing with Docker, what we're doing with AWS, and, uh, and what we're doing in uh, DevOps in general. The whole CI, uh, CI CD process is brand new to all of the developers in the building because we're used to pushing out those individual updates. Um, 
we didn't have a really rapid release cycle and things like that. So we're learning, what we do is we learn to support it ourselves. I've never had to place a phone call to anybody at Docker. So, which, um, you know, except to ask for swag. Uh, <laughs> uh, Docker, we've, uh, the documentation and everything that we were able to, to cobble together when we first started and when we started working with Flux 7, with their expertise, and we, we, were, uh, we were in pretty good shape from the beginning there. Great. One last ask. Does anybody have any questions from the audience? Okay. Can we get a round of applause then? Right. Thank you. Thank you.